Thank you for tuning in, audience, to, to Circling Dialogos. And my riffing and reading The Pearl Beyond Price by A.H. Olmos. I believe this is the fifth video of us diving in. It's currently uh, January the 2nd, 5.31 p.m. California time. And I was just noticing this time of year has this really wonderful in-between luminous about it right because it's we've just gone through christmas just gone through new year's i mean things are kind of open but things are th but you get the sense that they wouldn't be open really because nobody's quite out much well i guess it's the second so people are out shopping but i mean the general sense of the normal stores you know most people are you know barely recovered from the holidays and so there's much about this time where things don't have this, ah, oh, get to me, get to me, get to me. There's this hovering in between this, right? Where things don't say like, we got to get this done or go do this or run this errand or like the way the, the world normally talks to us. Phenomenologically, it's got this suspension and it happens to be, it happens to be super dark right now where I'm at. Like it's, it's like, you know, it's 5.30 in the evening. It's totally black outside. It had been rainy all day. It's been wonderfully, wonderfully minimal in its possibility, let's say. And it reminds me of, um, reminds me of kind of the space of being a child in childhood and that kind of dreamy place where the distinction between imagination and real real perceptions or something like that are still bleeding into one another. And, and today's kind of got that, that sense to it. So with that, let's read some all of us. All right. I'm just going to, I'm going to dive in here. Okay. Let me share the screen. Okay. Uh, right up. I'm going to start right underneath this. We left off of this quote by Mahler. And so I'll read that, the paragraph, starting on the paragraph underneath that quote. The sense of an individual self depends primarily on the establishment of a well-integrated self-image. The two primary inner structures, inner structures established in the process of ego development are the self-image and the mother image. So this is really, I think, what's important about this is, is to, in, I mean, it just my 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 work with circling and 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 exploring this, like live with people and myself and like a really intense practice. I mean, it's to, This is totally the deal, right? It's not just that we have we have identities and self images of ourselves that those very self images already always right are bound up and in response to a sense of the other of the world in other words there's no self that then is in a world no there's like self world there's no self that then is with others there's like self others and in fact from a developmental point of view right they co and mutually develop with each other. So my the image that I develop, right, in the very early, early years of development as a child, right, as this self-image forms, so does and it forms with, right, what I'm I'm embedded in relationship with, i.e., the mother, right? So as my self sense of self emerges and the images associated with that are completely in correlation with the sense of mother or the sense of whoever the caregiver is. They mutually start to set in, form, solidify. And therefore, as adults, like once this is fully formed and functioning or not functioning as the case may be, whenever, it's always the case, like all, any kind of reflective sense I have of myself 
already implies and is correlated with a sense of the world, a sense of other people. Um, those are always, they're within each, each image and they ref refer to each image even when I'm not thinking of the other at all. Very important. And I think this is quoting Mahler here again. In the fourth open-ended subphase, both inner structures, um, libidinal object constancy, as well as a unified self-image based on true ego identifications should have their inception. I'm going to read that again. I had a bunch of big words in it. In the fourth and open-ended subphase, were you aware that you had subphases, let alone four of them? Well, now you are. Both are inner structures, libidinal object constancy, as well as a unified self-image based on true ego identification should have their inception. And almost goes on. Thus, the achievement of a separate individuality and of object constancy and the consciously experienced manifestation of the inner development of the self-image and an internalized image of the mother. In fact, these achievements are the same thing as the development of the inner images. This is, this is an important point for our study in this book. So we emphasize it. The achievement of a separate individuality depends on two conditions, right? So one, first condition, the establishment of a cohesive self-image. And the second one is the internalization of a um, positively regarded image of the mother, the good mother. So the first one, the establishment of a cohesive self-image. In fact, the sense of being an individual is nothing but taking oneself to be this self-image. In other words, the individual is a mental structure, a construct of the mind. Before this construct is developed, according to objects relations theory, there is no sense of being a person. So I think one of the things, you know, that this, this shows and what psychology, especially objects relations, right, which is, I think Mahler's, I think is what Mahler either created was or was a part of, is is what they kind of discovered is that there is this sense of self that seems so evident to us. It just seems like we're born and it's given that we have one is not there. That it, it arises as a phenomena through the interaction with the environment and with the parents, right? And that our nervous system is organized in such a way that it starts to, it, it becomes the achievement of both the parents and the child the parent's nervous system, the child's nervous system, and their 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 particular constitutions to go from not having a self-image to having one. And that sense of self, now it's a mystery to me how an image gives you a sense of self, right? Because those are not the same thing. I mean, having a, a picture, a mental picture of yourself doesn't necessarily, I think, it's not obvious to me how that gives you a self-image. There must be some way of, one, constituting that picture, but then identifying with it such that it guides a sense, right? And organizes a sense and gives it meaning in some way. It's not obvious to me how their, it doesn't seem like their their relationship is connected because I would imagine the mind has many images that come it probably forms many the child forms many images in their in their child in their in their mind but but they it doesn't identify with the toaster let's say or it doesn't identify with like its little toe or the corner of the room it somehow identifies with this picture of itself right 
And then from that picture, the sense of self starts to consolidate. And with the mother, I guess, I guess that's a question for me, right? Is, and for all of us here is what's, how does it know what image to identify with of all the things that it could? I guess this is relevance realizations, a question for John Verveke as well. Okay, number two, the internalization of a positively regarded image of the mother, the good mother, the individual that is that self-image is supported psychically to be the presence of the mother's image. Thus, the child does not feel alone when physically separated from the mother. He feels supported by the presence of the mother's image, which gives him the sense of security, which allows him to be away from her and makes it safer to regard her as an autonomous person. So, so again, you know, this is in this is objects constancy. This idea of like, you don't see my face, right? You see my face, you don't see my face, you see my face. You have the sense of where you can, like, it. If you don't have objects constancy, every time you see my face, it's a it's an event of disclosure that's not connected to the. It doesn't. It's not connected to the face that was revealed before that, right? That's why you can play, play peekaboo. So with all things in the world, they come into appearance, they go out of appearance. They come into appearance, they go out of appearance. The, your mother comes into appearance and goes out of appearance, right? There's this constantly revealing, concealing, revealing, concealing, right? Imagine if you couldn't connect the dots, right? Imagine if, imagine if the, what the world would be like, like every time you saw your mother, you had to conceptualize her anew. And the mother was that was revealed to you now had no relationship to the mother that was there five minutes ago, right? Um, when she bef before she left the room, that has to all be developed. And I think what he what Mahler is saying and what psychology is saying is that that becomes developed through these internalizations of inner pictures that that in some sense inhabit inhabit the being or the the mental world of the child right and as it forms and it forms through these relationships right in the world and how they go if they're supportive or not supportive attuned not supportive and so the the formation of those images will be um correlate with how well that relationship goes right and so a lot's going on here at a very primordial level. But I think the important thing to get is that is that it's something that's formed. There is nothing that the child is born with that where it's given a self-image. No, this is this is an achievement. This is a communal, you're a communal achievement, right? Or lack of achievement or whatever you want to call it. Okay, I go on. Or almost goes on. These formations of objects relations theory are significant for our study in, in that they contradict the common belief that being a separate individual is an un, uncontroversible fact of life. Most of us believe that we are already persons when we are born small and dependent at the very beginning, maturing and becoming more independent as we grow up. The above discussion shows that this is not the case, but that the sense of being an entity, of being a person, is a developmental achievement. In fact, mental pathology is, inc is increasingly being seen as the disruption or distortion of this development, Haller states. The principal condition for for mental health so far as the pre um, the pre Oedipal development is concerned hinges on the attained and continuing ability of the child to retain or restore his self esteem in the context of relative libidinal object constancy. Man, Mueller is like technical as fuck. So let's read that again. The principal condition for mental health, so far as pre 
Oedipal development is concerned, hinges on the attained and continu continual ability of the child to retain or restore his self-esteem in the context of relative libidinal objects constancy. How well do you maintain your self-esteem in your relative um, libidinal objects constancy? I'll leave that. I'll leave that as a private question to ask yourself. He almost goes on. In this book, we will investigate the tremendous implication of the fact that the sense of being an individual is not only a development achievement, but is a feeling that results from ident identifying with a certain structure in the mind, the self image. That is, to take oneself to be a person separate from others with one's own volition is simply to identify with this construct in the mind. The self-image, the psychic structure, is nothing simple or superficial. It is complex and profound. And the identification with it is just as profound. For our purposes, however, it is crucial to remember that regardless of how completely the self-image has become part and parcel of one's sense of self, it is nevertheless simply a construct in the mind. Okay, so, okay. I think basically all this is saying what I, I already kind of, I guess, anticipated him saying. Um, But this achievement, right? That in other words, to become a sense of your, to be, to have a picture of yourself as an individual, um, distinct locus of agency with volition and will and all of that, right? In some sense, there's got to be a way that we can come to know that. And that coming to know that is an achievement. And we get that through this kind of mental picture or construction of ourselves. So in other words, even if it's already true that there, that I am a locus of self-will or whatever and an individual person and, and have, have agency, if, I, if I'm missing that, that mental construction, I, I, I think what he's saying is that would go unnoticed by me. It would be undistinct to me. I wouldn't be able to relate to myself in that way. I can come into a relationship with it. And as I do, I come into relationship with it through the, the construction of an image. And that image somehow affords me to have objects constancy with the world, right? So... In some sense, I wake up on Tuesday and there's this sense of myself and I wake up on Wednesday and although maybe a little bit different, I still have that sense of being the same self, the same thing on Thursday versus if I don't have that every time I wake up, I have to like re we have to reorganize this self and get to know him every single day. And I do that through and I achieve that through the relationship with the parents and the caregivers in the world. And, and that in that construction of myself, I simultaneously get a construction of you. And that when that process of construction and identification with those constructions, those self images break down, right, that explains a lot of our mental disorders and our uh, like when when we can't function in the world or identity crises or all the psychological disturbances that you and I have more than we wish to have come up. Um, it's increasingly we explain those or can explain those by those early relationships, right? And the malformation of those images. But there are mysteries here, right? About like how, right? How come I don't, how come I don't identify myself with like my mother's left toe, right? How do I know it's 
this picture of this body or something, right? Uh, that doesn't seem given. Almost goes on. Isn't this perception, isn't this perception that the experience of being an individual person is the feeling of identifying with the self-image exactly what the various spiritual teachings have stressed throughout the ages? Now they're bringing in like the religious ideas, right? And I guess we're going to come into bringing those back in or we're going to we're going to do a comparative analysis of what, how they see it. Isn't this perception that the experience of being an individual person is the feeling of identifying with a self-image exactly what the various spiritual teachings have stressed throughout the ages? We discussed above the teachings which state that the separate individual does not exist, that it is only an illusion. They have observed that the separate individual is a construction in the mind, just like psychology. That is, it is only thoughts. And although objects relations theory makes exactly the same observations, it is interpreted very differently. From this standpoint of view, of view the self-image is, or at least determines, who we are, and that is that. The individual is an intra-psychic development which determines and structures our minds, our perceptions in our world. And that is how we experience ourselves, period. So I think what Almas is implying or questioning or bringing this back together is like, from the perspectives of psychology, Having a self-image, constructing a self-image is something that that's developed through the relationships, right? And once if it's developed well and we can identify with it, it begin it gives us this sense of autonomy, this sense of being a separate individual, right? With its own will and a locus of sovereignty and all that kind of stuff. And when we bring in the we bring in religious traditions, they say basically the same thing. Right, that that um, that yourself is an image. It's made of thoughts. Right, it's developed probably through history. It's a mental construct, and it gives you a sense of self. But they say, get rid of that fucking thing, or minimize it, or dissolve it, or realize that it's just an image, or it's just mental constructions. So psychology says it's an achievement right? And a fought, hard fought one achievement. And, and um, spirituality or religious traditions say that it's, it's, maybe it's an achievement, but it's a, it's a shitty one. Get rid of that thing. Okay. That's guy's summary that of course is based on his limited self defected objects, constant um, self-image. So take it with a grain of salt. Okay, almost goes on. Otto Kernberg, one of the main contemporary theorists, theorists of objects relations theory, uses the term ego identity to refer to the concept of the self plus the world that it relates to. He states that the world the, e the world the ego perceives is a representational world, which is not exactly the real world, and that it is constructed, just like the ego, by the integration of mental representations or images of objects. Kerberg goes on. It has to be stressed, however, that this internal world of object of object representations are seen in consciousness, pre-consciousness, and unconscious fantasies never reproduce, reproduces the actual world of the real people with whom the individual has established relationships in the past and in the present. It is at most an approximation. 
always strongly influenced by the very early objects images of interjections and identifications. The general attitude of psychologists is to accept this ultimate lack of objectivity of the ego's perceptions as inevitable. Although, of course, much of psychotherapy um, consists in a learning process in the patient, which results in a more, quote, realistic, unquote, perception of himself and his world. The spiritual teachings, however, claim that it is not necessary to let to let the ego's identifications define ourselves, but that we can know ourselves more directly in a much more real way. They claim, in fact, that identification with with the construction of the self image in the in the mind cuts us off from our true nature and from seeing the true nature of reality. Okay, so I think Almas is starting to really kind of, really kind of um, tee up this conflict, right? That they're saying, yeah, the ego, they're both, both of them basically say they're they're made of mental constructions. Um, psychology basically says, just do that more and heal it where we're just dysfunctions, but that's it. Spirituality says, no, get rid of that thing, right? See through it. You there's so much more available than the than the you could say the phantoms of the mind that become this the constructed self-image. Right. So I think Almas is teeing off this conflict. So we'll see where it goes. Almost goes on. We must understand that development psychology has not has not been concerned with whether human beings have a more have a more real nature, a nature beyond the mind. The spiritual teachings, on the other hand, are concerned with human nature beyond ideas, images, or concepts in the mind. For them, a mental construct such as the self-image is fundamentally non-existent, is illusionary. For them, the fact that the mind contains the concept of a person does not mean that there, that there is truly a person any more than the concept of an apple, of an apple is an apple. If we take the mental construct away, there is no separate individual these teachings say that when the mind is still, then we see that there is no such thing as a separate individual. He goes on. Enlightenment does not involve simply the perception that the person is only a concept. It means that all conceptualizations, all conceptualization is ended. All images and representations of the mind, whether conscious, pre-conscious, or unconscious, are eliminated, or at least not identified with. When this profound stillness of the mind of the mind is achieved, it is asserted, true reality is perceived, not by an entity which is a separate individual. The experience is one of unqualified being wordless existence, infinite and eternal, right? So he's highlighting the point where we're basically enlightenment, right? Is the sensation or lack of identification with any, any mental representation or mental identification or picture or construction with reality. And that when that lack of identification the identification or dissolving of all of that mental activity is there. Enlightenment is revealed in the true reality, which is beyond all concepts, right? And conceptualizations can become real. I think there's a curveball coming though. Stay tuned. The claim of these teachings is that while the individual has no true existence because it is an idea in the mind, being is a true existence. It is what is actually there, whether we are aware of it or not. 
And it is this existence, this presence of being, independent of any of any inner image that is what we are. We are not using the term being in its everyday sense. Usually being means mere existence. And that existence is, like everything else, experienced conceptually. The spiritual traditions, on the other hand, use this term to refer to the actual presence of true nature, which can be directly experienced. We are using the term in the latter sense. As human beings, we are presence. We are being. We are actuality. We are not simply mental constructs. The sense of oneself as a separate individual, which, as we have seen, depends upon the development of a cohesive self-image, can be seen as composed of memories and, in fact, cannot exist without its connection to memories, to personal history. But the memory of a person is not the same as a person. The memory is of something that supposedly existed at some point in the past. This is another reason traditional teachings say that the individual or ego does not exist. A memory exists as an idea, but not as a, pres as a presence in independent of the mind. In other words, the separate individual has no beingness, no substance, and no true existence. Our true nature is an existence which is not based on memory or on time at all. Being is eternal and timeless. We are not referring here to what people call being in the present. We are pointing out that we are timeless presence, that our nature is not time bound as ego is. Timeless means that the sense of time is ir irrelevant to our true natures. Eternal means that there is no sense of memory or future in it. There is no concept of time. So there is no sense of present time. When the mind is still, there is just presence, just being unqualified by ideas or concepts of time or individuality. Thus, when we cease the, con the construct, we, thus when we cease to construct entities of the mind, we see that the ego does not exist. We then simply are. So, to believe, so to believe that we are the separate individuality is to take ourselves to be something that does not truly exist <laughs> and to fail to see who we are, to fail to realize our true essence. No wonder then that we are dissatisfied and suf in suffering, just as the, as the Buddha observes. We can note here that this suffering is not a problem that can be solved therapeutically. It is not a matter of emotional conflict. Psychologists and psycho psychotherapists deal, deal, deal usefully with human suffering by working on the conflicts of the personality. But from the perspective of spiritual teachings, this approach clearly cannot deal with the basic problem, the root of all emotional conflicts. And I think, I think we can understand why it can't, right? or it apparently can, is because the, from the spiritual perspective, the, the fact that I identify with myself with any mental construction, right, um, is a going astray or a covering over of the reality. And the reality is that I'm timeless being. Any construct that I have is going to be based on memory. It's going to be based on time, right? I am not a representation of myself. I may have representations, but those representations can't really represent the totality of myself, which is beyond future, past, and present, right? I'm a timeless, badass stillness, an identityless clearing. So there. And 
if psychology, right, is going to help you work out conf conflicts, and those conflicts are based on representations, and therefore, if psychology is all about the achievement of the mind and the, its constructions, it will try to have you get a better construction of yourself. So you may construct yourself as somebody who can't form concepts of itself, which is another concept, right? So in some sense, in some sense, you know, the mind, and I think a lot of Eastern traditions and mysticism would say the mind is really great for things outside of itself. When the problem isn't the mind, the mind can point itself towards the world and, and makes a progress. But what happens when the problem is the mind? Well, the mind will turn towards itself and apply more of itself to itself, but that's the problem. So it ends up being like quicksand. In therapy, if it's confused, which because it believes in images and constructs, it's going to be confused, right? It will just simply have you, um, I think what, what Almas is implying here or what's being implied, you know, what Almas is saying is that if therapy attempts to do that, the best it can do is maybe make the process of, of sinking oneself in, in the quicksand of the mind a little, like just make it help you to do it without crying as much or something. I don't know. I'll go on and then we'll, I'll read it another couple of, I'll read to the end of this page and then we'll, I think I want to call it an, an evening till next time. Almost goes on. This perspective of the man of spirit, which contrasts ego with being and sees the latter as fundamentally real and the former as illusionary, illusionary is incomprehensible from the perspective of ego, which cannot conceive of experience that is not related to a separate individuality. For ego... Each experience is personal, related to oneself. The man of the world will understandably ask, well, how can I, how can there be experience if I am not there? The fact is that the experience of impersonal universality, the boundless presence with no hint of personality, the unfathomable void, are not the only ways to experience being, our true essence and existence. Most teachers who have, have this perspective of absolute being talk as if one can experience either the separate individuality of ego or the universal, universal impersonality of the ultimate conceptual reality. But this view negates the richness of the human essence and the ever abundant realm of being and thus fails to communicate to the man of the world who feels misunderstood and cannot see the truth or even or even relevance of the spiritual viewpoint. Okay, so you're probably experiencing a little sigh of relief, right? Because now we're the the um now the the world of the, the the man of the world and the man of the spirit um aren't just opposed to one other one another right and especially maybe the man of spirit and his ideas doesn't it it, it just doesn't have the whole ball in its court right it can't it, it wants to maybe hog the ball of enlightenment or something but almost is saying maybe the personal essence is something more that the of the world, the man of the spirit doesn't understand completely, right? He's kind of setting that up, which seems like a good place to come to completion. I don't want these videos to go over 45 minutes or so at 41 minutes. So I want to go ahead and complete there. Thank you for tuning in. If I haven't already said so, um, some housekeeping. If you're interested in working with me one-on-one, -on -one, just email me. Um, we'll schedule an exploratory session and talk about it from there. If um, we have a dialectic and a dialogos coming up in a month and a half or so, um, link for that is below. All things circling, links for that is below, plus the links to some video to check that out further. Thank you so much. And Happy New Year, by the way. <laughs>